Crossing Nation. It is so good to see each and every single one of you. Turn to your neighbor, say something nice like, you look great today. Oh, good for you. All right, turn to your second favorite neighbor and tell them what your favorite color is. What's your favorite color? All right, now, say it with me to all of our locations. Help me out in saying what this color is for those of the people at all of our locations who might wrestle with being colorblind. This balloon is blue. You nailed it. (laughs) During this sermon series, we were discussing all kinds of topics. We were talking about the reliability of the resurrection of Jesus Christ, the evidence for a creator in Genesis 1 through 11, the reliability of the Bible. We talked about the historical record surrounding the appearance and life of Jesus Christ. We explored the philosophical arguments for the existence of God and came to what many of us would say is the logical conclusion that there must be a God that is revealed to us in the Bible. We examined the alternative worldviews that exist around us and we put them underneath the microscope and we found them wanting. If God is real, if Jesus is alive, and if the Bible is true, that has massive implications for how we see ourselves and how we live our lives. This sermon series was born out of an evangelistic heart. We wanted to give you answers to questions that people you care about, people who might be atheists, people who might be skeptics, and give them the necessary information to help them start their faith walk with the Lord. And I'm asking you to celebrate with me that during this sermon series, 123 people have decided to get baptized. Isn't that incredible? And so this sermon series didn't just though come from an evangelistic place, it also came from a pastoral heart. I know many people who have a faith that at times needs strengthened, a faith that at times needs reaffirmed, a faith that at times needs solidified. Here at The Crossing, you've heard us talk about this a bunch. We exist for everybody on this spiritual spectrum. We are committed to everybody, no matter where they're at on their spiritual journey, to those who hate God, don't believe in God, and to those who were around when God made the world. We are here for all the people in between. And we are committed to help people discover God. And we're also committed to help those who are in Christ grow in their intimate personal relationship with Jesus Christ. And if over this sermon series you missed any of the weeks and you wanna catch up, or maybe there's a sermon that you're going, you know what, my friend needs to hear this. Uh, One of the easiest ways, people ask this sometimes, and so here's the easiest way for you to uh, watch our sermons when you miss them, or to share a sermon if you wanna give it to somebody. You go to the crossing, go to YouTube, type in One Crossing, that's the handle, but we're called The Crossing, it'll look, it'll have our logo, and you'll always have all access to all of the different sermons that we are pushing out. Now, I wanna welcome all of our different locations, those of you joining online, those of you who are part of our inside family, And I wanna tell you, stay connected this summer. We know what's about to happen. Everybody comes to church from Easter until Mother's Day, and then when mom goes back to her church, everybody starts doing whatever they want. And we wanna tell you that we believe this summer could be one of the best seasons for your spiritual growth. In fact, next weekend, we are gonna be giving you something and starting something at our church, and then the following weekend, we are going to launch it everywhere. And if you will go on this spiritual journey with us, I believe that by the end of this summer, you will be in a place in your relationship with God that you never thought you would be. But we can't do that work for you. That's a decision that you have to make, but we are incredibly excited about it and hope that it'll be nourishing to your soul and to your relationships. But what I wanna do is I wanna talk to you more about my blue balloon. Because this sermon series is for those of you who are keeping track of cultural issues. This sermon is for those of you who are paying attention to politics. This sermon is for those of you who are parents and you are worried about the world that your kids are uh, experiencing and you're worried about what they might be learning in school. This sermon is for those of you who are teachers, who are concerned about what you might be asked to teach in the coming years and if your conscience will allow you 
to do so. This sermon is for those of you who are mourning the direction that our world is taking. This sermon is for those of you who are grandparents and want an opportunity to be able to connect, understand, and possibly correct the worldview of your grandchildren. This sermon is for those of you who are deeply committed to your faith and you want to leave a spiritual legacy. This sermon is for those of you who feel like the target of who you're supposed to be, how you're supposed to live, what words you're supposed to say keeps moving, and so you're trying to figure out how are you supposed to navigate this world because it keeps shifting week after week. And some of you right now are thinking, is he going where I think he's going? No. And there's some of you who are going, is he going where I think he's going? And you're really excited about that. And there's some of you are going, is he going where I think he's going? And you're incredibly concerned about that. Well, here's the news. We are going there, just not today. In September, we are gonna take a deep dive into a sermon series. Right now, I'm calling it Hot Topic, but you know, for anybody who didn't shop at that bad store, uh, <laughs> over the top of their head. So uh, we're gonna come up with a better name. But we are gonna be taking a meaningful, deep, caring look at culture wars. We are gonna be talking about the value of life, about gender, about sexuality, and the Christian response. But that's not today. Today, like I told you guys, is about my blue balloon. John chapter 14 has, records these words. Jesus answered, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. This is an exclusive claim. The only way to get to God is through Jesus. If you really know me, that's Jesus, you will know my Father as well. From now on, you do know him and have seen him. Look at the claims that Jesus is making right out of the gate. Jesus is saying to know Jesus is to know the truth. If you want to know truth, you must know Jesus. He's making another claim. If you know the truth, you will know Jesus, and if you know Jesus, you will know God. Pilate, who was the Roman governor of Judea, was in a conversation with Jesus right before he sentenced Jesus to death by crucifixion. And Jesus said these words to him. You say that I am a king. In fact, the reason I was born and came into the world is to testify to the truth. Everyone on the side of truth listens to me. Can you be on the side of truth and not be in a right relationship with Jesus? Jesus is making a compelling argument here that if you want to be on the side of what is true, if you want to be on the side of what is right, then you get there by listening to Jesus. Not CNN. Not Fox News, not Twitter, not Instagram. You don't get there by listening to the right preacher or attending the right school or taking the right HR training. You get to the side of truth by listening to Jesus. And the good news is there is no barrier to you being able to listen to Jesus. All you need is a willing heart that has been empowered by the Holy Spirit which you receive after you get baptized. Look at how the Holy Spirit helps us in our understanding of God, which our understanding of God is our understanding of Jesus, and our understanding of Jesus is our understanding of truth. Let me show it to you. First Corinthians chapter two. However, as it is written, what no eye has seen, what no ear has heard, and what no human mind has conceived, the things God has prepared for those who love him. Remember, God loves everybody. And God's love for everybody never changes. But God has something in store, something that you and I can't fathom, something that you and I can't understand if we love him. Now, let's keep going. These things, God has revealed to us by his spirit. Not a four-year degree, not a two-year certificate. Nope, he revealed these things by his spirit. 
How do we get the Holy Spirit? After we get baptized. The Spirit searches all things, even the deep things of God. Let's keep going. For who knows a person's thoughts except their own spirit within them? Let me explain that one. Right now, there are thoughts going through your head that if the person sitting next to you heard, they wouldn't sit next to you. Isn't that that amazing? We all have friends because they don't really know us. Because if you've met people with no filter, like no filter, and to think that those people still have a filter, right? You guys have an opinion on how I look. You think about it. You have opinion on what other people drive. You have opinions on everything. And some of those opinions, most of those opinions, you keep locked down. Those of you who are married, husbands, you know how to just go what? (laughs) Okay? So, who knows your thoughts? Only you can know your thoughts. Now watch this. In the same way, no one knows the thoughts of God except the Spirit of God. So the Spirit of God understands the thoughts of God. Now watch what the Spirit of God does. Keep going. Whatever we have received is not the Spirit of the world, but the Spirit who is from God, so that we may understand what God has freely given us. The Spirit of God reveals to you and I the mind of God. You cannot understand God without the Holy Spirit. You cannot have the Holy Spirit unless you're in a right relationship with him. You don't have a right relationship with him or you don't begin a right relationship with him until you're obedient in the area of baptism. Who is from God so that we may understand what God has freely given us. Your understanding of your your place with God is revealed to you by the Holy Spirit. Now let's keep going. This is what we speak, not in our words taught to us by human wisdom, but in words taught by the Holy Spirit, explaining spiritual realities with spirit-taught words. Forgiveness is a spirit-taught word. We're able to forgive because God is our model of forgiveness. Love is a spirit-taught word because we love because he first loved us. Let's keep going. The person without the spirit does not accept the things that come from the spirit of God, but considers them foolishness and cannot understand them because they are discerned only through the Spirit. Some of us are getting in arguments about spiritual things with somebody who doesn't have the Spirit, which means they can't understand spiritual truths because their minds have not been transformed by the Spirit of God. We are trying to have a cultural argument with somebody instead of a spiritual conversation. Once their mind has been made right spiritually, then you can have a discussion about issues of the world. Some of us are trying to make the world Republican instead of Christians. Some of us are trying to make the world Democrats instead of Christians. And we are having a cultural war instead of a Christ-like conversation. Pilate's response to Jesus' truth claim is probably one of the most famous challenges that everybody has faced at some point in their life. After Jesus said this, this is what Pilate said. What is truth? Jesus says, anybody who is on the side of truth listens to me. And Pilate's response is, what is truth? Well, let's answer that question. What is truth? Truth can be broken down into three main categories. Those of you who ever took... uh, an ethics class, you've probably uh, spent a little bit of time here. The first one is objective truth. Objective truth is true whether you believe it or not. An objective truth doesn't care about your feelings. Objective truth just spits facts. An objective truth, this is a balloon. Now, there's another category to truth. This one is called subjective truth. Subjective truth can be true for you, but is not necessarily true for me. A subjective truth is something that's true for me, but might not be true for you. The best balloons are blue balloons. 
That's a subjective truth because I am the subject of the truth. You can have a favorite balloon and your answer can be true too. You have objective truth. Doesn't care about your feelings. It weighs its, uh, it puts its weight on everybody. Subjective truth is dependent upon you, the subject. And you can have a truth and I can have a truth. We can all have truths. And these truths can be in conflict with one another and still be true. I have a favorite color balloon and you have a favorite color balloon. Everything's fine. Then there is situational truths. These are true in lots of areas, but not every area. A situational truth would be, you should give people balloons. That's a situational truth. When someone gets married, you give them a balloon. They have a baby, you give them a balloon. It's their birthday, happy birthday. Here's a balloon. Did you just get a promotion at work? Balloons, we should be balloon giving people. <laughs> However, not every situation should have balloons. I heard your dad died. Oh, I heard you lost your job. Right? I heard your mother-in-law died. Okay, here's balloons. Like, there's, there's certain situations, and you might be going, sometimes Clayton jokes, situationally would have been funny in my car, but not during a church service. That's a situational truth, because it was funny. Or it was a subjective truth. It was tr funny to you. Or it was an objective truth. Clayton's never not funny. <laughs> truth claims fall into these three categories. Now hear me. Culture is created by which truths you put in which categories. That is how culture is created. Imagine what happens when a group of people don't like where a certain truth claim gets put. Or they want to move a truth claim from one category to another category. You have more than likely heard people talk about my truth. Well, my truth is a subjective truth. But we are living in a world where people are elevating subjective truths into objective categories. That what is true for me must be true for you. What is true for me, you have to live by. My truth is law, or my truths are becoming laws. And then which group do you allow to make the laws about their subjective claims to create objective realities? This is how culture works. And anytime people start moving one truth claim from one category to another category, you are gonna have culture wars, because these, uh, these big issues where culture's created around certain truths living in certain categories. Now let's get spiritual. Jesus's central truth claim that he was pushing forward was not that he was some great teacher, although he was. Not that he was a miracle worker, although he was. Not that he was a divine miracle worker, although he was. Jesus' central claim was that he was the son of God, sent by the love of God to redeem the people of God, to, to bring them to the home of God. Look what it says in Matthew chapter 16. When Jesus came to the region of Caesarea Philippi, those of you going to Israel, we'll be there. And he asked his disciples, who do people say the Son of Man is? Jesus is talking about himself here. Let's keep going in the text. They replied, some say John the Baptist, others say Elijah, and still others say Jeremiah, or one of the prophets. Jesus, here are all the different ways that people view you. These are their truth claims. They think you're John the Baptist. They think you're one of the prophets. So Jesus keeps going, okay. But what about you? 
he asked, who do you say that I am? And Simon Peter answered, you are the Messiah, the son of the living God. So that's his answer. Peter says, you are the Messiah, you are the son of God. Was he right? Well, let's find out, because the next verse gives us the answer to the test. Jesus replied, blessed are you, Simon, son of Jonah, for this was not revealed to you by flesh and blood. Hold on a second, where was this truth revealed? But by my Father in heaven. To know the truth is to know Jesus, to know Jesus is to know God. You can't know the truth without knowing God and without knowing Jesus. Peter recognizes the truth, Jesus reaffirms the truth because God revealed the truth that this is who Jesus is. Now question, what kind of truth claim is this? Is this a situational claim? Did Jesus come to earth, live a perfect life, heal people, preach fantastic messages, and die on a cross to usher in a situational kingdom, a situational gospel, situational grace, situational hope, situational healing? Was that the thrust of Jesus' message? Or did Jesus die on a cross so that we would follow him in all areas of our life? Presidential candidates, we're a year away, a year and a half away from it being even stupider than it is now. And you will be hard pressed to find a presidential candidate that does not believe in God. And you'll be hard pressed to find a candidate who will not say something along these lines. My faith is a private matter and I will not bring my private faith into public life. Situationally, I'm gonna allow God to be the God of my heart, but not my decision making, not my rule and management of the future of our country. And when they make that claim, what they do is they satisfy weak-minded religious people who think that a person who claims to at least know God is somehow a perk, but then they satisfy everybody who doesn't want a religious uh, leader to go, well, at least he's not gonna impose his faith. I just have a personal faith. When I'm at home with my family, I'm gonna follow Jesus, but when I'm leading the government, I'm gonna do whatever I I'm not gonna bring my faith into it. Well, what's the point in having a faith if it's not gonna influence the decisions you make? How you respond to people, how you love people, how you care for people. What good is a faith that doesn't transform you, doesn't cause you to sacrifice or submit to it? What good is a faith that has no business in your public life? Because Jesus did not preach a gospel, follow me and tell nobody about it. Follow me and don't show anybody what it means to be like me. Now, before you guys get all Republican or Democrat, listen, we're just here to talk about my blue balloon. Stay the course. Now, what people end up doing is they treat God like ketchup. Ketchup is great on some things, just not everything. Ketchup is good on a dog. It's good on a burger. It's good on scrambled eggs. Does anybody scrambles their eggs and puts some ketchup on it? Praise God for you. Take the weekend off. You don't have to tithe this weekend. God bless you. How many of you, how many of you get down with some, with some ketchup on your hash browns? Mashed potatoes? Isn't that weird? Hash browns? Yeah. Fries? Yeah. Mashed potatoes? No. Yeah, I get it. Isn't that the truth, though? We'll put, we'll put ketchup on all those things, but not our corn on the cob, not our Fruit Loops. There's just certain places where we want ketchup and there's some places we don't. And while we get frustrated with our plank eye looking at the world doing the same thing, we do it all the time in our own life. I want you to be the God of my prayer life, just not my financial life. Okay, you guys have to dive. Uh, you, can be the, you can be the God of my problems, but you can't be the God of my sex life. You can't be the God of my Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, just the God of my Sunday. Deep down inside, many of us functionally operate and just want a Jesus who's good situationally. I wanna do what I want, 
And when the situation gets out of hand, I want to call in rescue Jesus. And so we get frustrated in a world culturally who's living situationally when spiritually we've situationally handcuffed ourselves. Because when you take God out of every situation, you create a mess in every one of those situations. Because if God is not the one directing your paths, you are responsible for the outcome of your paths. Well, maybe Jesus came and he died on the cross for a subjective truth, that it would just be true for you. And you can have your faith in Jesus and I can have mine. You can have your faith in Jesus, and I can be a Buddhist. I can follow Islam. I can be an atheist. And we can all live in perfect harmony because Jesus is good for you, he's just not good for me. I just don't know how I feel about it. And so people are completely okay with you having a subjective faith with Jesus. Yeah, you can believe Jesus. I just believe something different. Well, these two things cannot be true. Jesus cannot be the way, the truth, the life, the only way to the Father, and at the same time, there be another way to the Father. You are not believing the same things. The truth of the claim is based on how you feel about it. Is it true for you? Or is Jesus making an objective truth claim? that I am the son of God. Everything that has been created was made by me and for me and through me. And it doesn't matter what you think about it. It doesn't matter what you believe about it because nothing can change who I am. Your thoughts, your feelings, your belief doesn't remove me from the throne because I sit here because of who I am, not because of who you think I am. In fact, you can make up your mind now or you can kneel later is what it says. That there will come a day where every tongue will declare on bended knee, that Jesus is the Christ? Is Jesus making an objective claim that this is true regardless of how you feel about it? That you must submit, you must follow, you must obey? It appears to me that the statements in John 14, Jesus is making an objective claim. So how do people deal with this fundamental question about Jesus creates What category you put Jesus in creates culture. Well, how does this happen? And what happens when people have Jesus in different categories? It creates culture clashes. Because culture does four things, at least four things. First thing culture does is culture speaks. Culture communicates. Culture tells us what we value and are the beliefs of a group of people. It helps you read and understand the people around you, what's important to them. You can tell what a school values by where they spend their money, on sports programs or research facilities. Uh, Fast food restaurants tell you something about a culture, that what people value. They value mediocre food, fast, because they're super busy, and no one likes to cook after a long day of work. It tells you something, but you go to another country and you won't see as many drive throughs because that culture values something different. Uh, SUVs and minivans and electric cars tell us something about our culture. Our holidays speak about what we value as people. Mother's Day, Father's Day, Veterans Day, Memorial Day tell you what Americans want to esteem. Culture doesn't just speak, though. Culture sinks. It makes us feel at home. It gives us a sense of peace. It makes you feel safe. Those of you who've traveled outside of the US or even for those of you who've traveled to another city and things are no longer on your terms, you're in a different bed, you're dealing with language barriers, you're dealing with food challenges, transportation stories, because anybody who's ever traveled outside the country has a transportation story. And you probably felt out of sync when you were overseas because you were out of your culture. After a long trip, you get home and you get in your bed. The bed that you don't care about or all that much anytime, 
But after you've been gone for like seven days, you get in your own bed and you go, oh, culture sinks. Do you feel at home? There are certain areas of your life where you feel at home in culture. And some of the culture crashes that are happening is as people are moving us. They're changing our bed, they're changing the thermostat in the house, and you're going, this feels out of sync. Culture doesn't just sink, it spreads. Culture is viral. For decades, you could, <coughs> you could see what was happening on the East Coast and on the West Coast and know what would be at our door in the next 10 years. But now in the age of social media, what happens out there is here. Every presidential campaign begins with the desire for a culture that spreads a grassroots campaign with enough power that spreads fast enough to land them in the White House. It's not just politically though, we see it in language, in fashion, in music, and in design. Culture spreads. But most importantly, culture shapes. We care about what our kids are exposed to, what they're taught in school, because we know that they will eventually be shaped by it. We know that deep down inside, what our kids are exposed to matters. It shapes us. So while we have the ability to shape culture, more often than not, culture shapes you and me. Husbands, come here. You didn't know your house was outdated until culture told your wife that it was. And so you're taking perfectly functioning cabinets, countertops, sinks, faucets, and tile out of a house, not because they've lost their youthfulness, but because culturally, your wife has been indoctrinated. And now you are suffering the consequences. And today, we fight. No, okay, okay. This is, so imagine how Jesus, the Son of God, Savior of the world as a situational truth, impacts how the world would speak and think and value. Think of how they would feel out of place with a group of people who see Jesus as the Son of God as an objective truth. So what are Christians to do? How are we to respond? What is our path forward? You see the values, you see culture shifting around us. What do we do? And there are some good Christian people. What they're gonna do is they're gonna reject it. They're gonna pick a fight. They're gonna get hostile. There's gonna be a war, not on my watch. And there are definite places where Christians should push back as often as necessary and as long as necessary. We should be completely against slavery, sex trafficking, proliferation of pornography, the abuse of the vulnerable, cannot and should not be tolerated or allowed. There are areas where Christians should fight back and say, no, this will not happen. There are some Christians, in response to the cultural challenges, they're gonna say, you know what we're gonna do? We're gonna receive it. And some of you are like, nope, listen to me. Sometimes the best Christian response to culture is to receive it. Some would say that that is exactly what Paul is doing in 1 Corinthians chapter nine. Listen to what the apostle Paul says. Though I am free and belong to no one, I have made myself a slave to everyone. Why? To win as many people as possible. I took my freedom and I embodied the culture of a slave to win as many people as possible. Let's keep going. To the Jews, I became like a Jew to win the Jews. To those under the law, I became like one under the law, though I myself am not under the law, so as to win those under the law. Let's keep going. To those not having the law, I became like one not having the law, though I am not free from God's law, but am under Christ's law, so as to win those not having the law. Let's keep going. To the weak, I embodied the culture of the weak to win the weak. I have become all things to all people so that by all possible means, I might save some. Paul's saying, I'm gonna step into culture. I'm gonna be in those places and I'm gonna do it to blend in 
and to win the opportunity to have a conversation. If culture's about lifted trucks, then I'm gonna lift the Toyota Avalon. If culture's all about country music, then get ready for some foot stomping worship songs. If culture's about khakis and polos, then get out the iron, because we're about to pleat some stuff. This is not about compromise. This is not about silencing your beliefs, but building a bridge to express your beliefs to a culture you want to win. Some people will say, nope, the Christian response is to retreat. We're not gonna fight, and we're definitely not gonna receive. We are not gonna blend in. We are gonna withdraw completely from culture. In an effort to pursue holiness, to protect their family from the ways of the world, they're going to pull way back. Uh, They might be doing this in private schools or in homeschooling. They might do this in removing technology pieces in their life, and they'll never be the cool, hip couple that's up to speed on the latest binge-worthy Netflix show. All of these approaches have strong biblical arguments, but they also have devastating potential pitfalls. To those who reject culture, they may never have the loving voice that others need to hear. To those who receive culture, they may never live out a full gospel distinctiveness. To those who retreat, they will struggle to live out the Great Commission. I think there's a better way. That we should function as a royal priesthood. This is what it says in 1 Peter. But you are a chosen people, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, God's special possession, that you may declare the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his wonderful light. Let's keep going. Once you were not a people, but now you are the people of God. He fashioned you, he bought you, he brought you in, he made you into who you are. Once you had not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. In service to King Jesus, you and I, we become a royal priesthood. Our royalty, we belong to him, and then we are priests. What do priests do? Priests do one thing really stinking well. They connect God to future people of God. They live in the tension, in between. They are constantly reaching out and grabbing a hold and drinking deeply from the word of God and from the spirit of God and contextualizing it to the people that God is trying to reach. Later, uh, Paul says that we are to be ambassadors for King Jesus. Later, in this very uh, chapter, Peter calls us aliens and strangers in this world. Too many of us are trying to take back our country. This world is not ours. This country is not ours. This is not our kingdom. Our kingdom is in the heavenly realms. It is a spiritual reality and nobody can take it from us. We are to be way more concerned about God's kingdom than our earthly realities. But we are to be concerned with taking the earthly realities and surrendering them and using them to draw people in to the spiritual realities of Christ while we live in it. While we love the people in it, this is not our home. This is not our kingdom. And what we choose to do as a royal priesthood is stand in the gap, connecting people. We speak truth, but we do it in love. We seek justice, but we understand mercy. We expect transformation, but we preach grace. And when you do this, to those who choose to live in the tension of being holy in a stained world, while declaring the goodness of God, the supremacy of Jesus, and the transformative power of the Holy Spirit to a broken and hurting world around us, we will take arrows from both sides. We will be aliens and strangers in this world. To the religious elites, they will call us soft on doctrine, and the world will call us old-fashioned. To the religious elites, we will be called conformists, and to the world, they'll call us out of touch. However, it will be in these very moments where we embrace the royal priesthood, where we stand in the gap, and we preach and we point people to Jesus, where we talk about the goodness of God, and we are continually reaching out to his people. It is in those moments that you and I just might be the most like Jesus, who was crucified by the religious elites and the world that God was trying to reach. I hope you'll join me in that as we move to this time of decision. So.
So what do you say to that kind of Jesus? What kind of truth claim are you ready to make today? Some of you, you've been living with a situational Jesus with a situational king. And that God doesn't save. Some of you have been living with a subjective truth claim when it comes to Jesus. It's just good for me, but it's not good for my family. It's not good for my coworkers. They can keep believing what they believe. But that's not what Jesus believes. You and I must come to a place where we're willing to make the objective truth claim that Jesus is the Christ, the son of the living God, and I want him as my Lord and my Savior. The people of God have always been faced with this challenge. Eve was lured away from God in the garden. After the rescue of the Israelites and the deliverance of those in the promised land, Joshua reclaimed to the people, you must trust God, take him at his word, know the truth, cling to the truth. And here's Joshua, he, he looks out at the people who are in the promised land and he makes this incredible declaration. Those of you who grew up in church, you've heard it your whole life. See if this sounds situational, subjective, or objective. This is what he says. Now fear the Lord and serve him with all faithfulness. Throw away the gods of your ancestors that they were worshiped beyond the Euphrates River and in Egypt and serve the Lord. But if serving the Lord seems undesirable to you, then choose for yourselves this day whom you will serve. Whether the God of your ancestors who served beyond the Amorite or uh, Euphrates or the gods of the Amorites in whose land you are now living. But as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. And the future of your family and the future of your life and the future of the culture wars that lie ahead, and the future of your salvation lays at the answer to that question, who will you serve? And if you are here today, and King Jesus is not your king, don't put it off. You can start an intimate personal relationship with him today. In just a few moments, the people around you are gonna stand and begin singing, and some people are gonna come up to the steps and start praying, and you can go right over to the baptistry, and you can spend some time talking with somebody about how to begin that relationship to the rest of you in here. The Christians, a culture war's coming, but the only way we're gonna solve these issues is with a heart, with a spirit, with a mind, with a mouth, with behavior that has been surrendered and purified through the Lordship of Jesus Christ. Would you join me in that mission? Would you stand with me? Heavenly Father, thank you for today. Thank you for this church. Oh, I love them so much. And God, I, I can't even fathom how much you love them. And God, I pray that you would do a work in every single person, whether here in this room or watching online, to draw them closer to you. In your name I pray, amen.